Yes, so we're back and uh, we will resume our discussion of uh, supernovae shocks. Yeah, and it's always good to uh, uh, in astrophysics, uh, which which gives us so many pretty pictures, to restart our discussion from the last pretty picture that we saw. So uh, this uh, is what we had seen uh, some time ago. Um, a multi wavelength picture of Tycho supernova remnant. One, one such spectacular. Uh, so, this is not the supernova itself, okay? This is the supernova remnant. In other words, the supernova would, would have been somewhere in the center and it would have gone off and it has, it has passed and uh, for reasons that we will see, uh, it, it, it set off a, a blast wave and the blast wave propagated quasi spherically okay in a roughly spherical manner heating the material inside it to varying degrees okay and so and the heated material uh, emits at various wavelengths so what this is is a collage of images at various wavelengths none at visible wavelengths okay but they i mean all, what you see here is a false color image okay this is a multi wavelength image uh, you see um, what happens is you have you have different instruments capturing different wavelengths. For visible, you will have one kind of, one kind of CCD. For x-rays, you will have a completely different instrument. Okay. So, you will have a, a, an image, uh, pixels, and these pixels are superposed together to give you this incredibly pic pretty picture. And uh, uh, the, the, the different colors you see here represent different wavelengths, not in the optical. That's all I want to say. So the main thing you should take away from this picture is uh, is that um, you know there are di different ki there are different wavelengths present, indicative of the fact that there are different temperatures present as as the shock wave has uh, passed through. So all of this would represent shocked material, material that has experienced a shock wave passing through it. The other most important thing is the incredibly quasi spherical incredibly near spherical nature of, of of this front here okay it's it's almost as if you can actually this uh, blue line represents so let me show you another picture uh, which shows yeah so this is the same object in radio at radio wavelengths now radio wavelengths the specialty about radio wavelengths is that they are very good tracers of energetic electrons Okay, of accelerated electrons. Okay, so um, they are good, um, good tracers of uh, accelerated electrons. That's what radio wavelengths are good for. And this picture is essentially showing you the color code is that this would be, uh, the red would be uh, brightest or, 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 yeah, brightest essentially. And here the deep blue would be uh, dimmest. Okay, so what this is telling you is that the, the largest concentrate of concentration indirectly, indirectly of course, what this picture is telling you is that the largest concentration of accelerated electrons are to be found roughly on the rim here. It's not very, it's not terribly spherically symmetric. I mean, you know, this green is somewhere in between red and blue, right? So here the concentration of accelerated electrons is somewhat lower than what it is here, but still it's definitely higher than it is in the center. So what you have is a rim, what, what, what this, uh, um, this picture is essentially showing you is a rim, okay, this kind of a rim of energetic energetic or accelerated electrons that's what this picture is essentially telling you there's a rim of accelerated electrons 
And as we have discussed many, many times, the utility of shocks in astrophysics, the reason we are interested in shocks in, in, in astrophysical context is that they are very good uh, agents for accelerated electrons, for accelerating electrons, for taking electrons from a thermal pool and, and accelerating them into non-thermal electrons. And here you see an evidence Utopia most likely refers to the constellation it was found in and so on and so forth. Okay, this again is a multicolor image and uh, the main thing is, is a multicolor meaning multi wavelength image uh, and, and then the main thing to note here is the incredible spherical symmetry. Okay, so, uh, so having seen these pretty pictures let us proceed to try to understand what is behind them. Okay, right, so the main assumptions like we said we are talking about a blast wave, okay. We are a blast wave, the kind that would be produced due to um, a, the injection of a large amount of energy, right, of a large amount of energy uh, at a point such as what would be produced by a bomb. And we uh, bomb explosions are very, very similar to supernova explosions. Okay. So let us consider, uh, and so, so this is different from a piston driven wave. A large amount of energy injected into a point, okay, mathematically speaking, an ideal point, of course, you know, a large amount of energy is never injected into a, in, 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 into a you know point with zero dimensions is always but still in practice what this means is that the, uh, there is a large amount of energy injected into a very small region. Okay. The density of the medium into which uh, this energy is injected is say rho 1. We neglect any energy losses due to radiation. In other words as the shock propagates. Okay. Um, as the shock propagates, it accelerates particles, right? And these uh, particles will radiate, and they radiate. We neglect these accelerated particles will radiate, right? They radiate energy, which is how we, we uh, observe these things, right? What we do here is we, uh, we neglect, we neglect any energy losses due to radiation. In other words, the E, this E that we talk about here is conserved. The E remains constant with time. This is called the adiabatic uh, assumption, okay? Um, and, and so, uh, this is good for supernova shock waves up for, for a certain phase of evolution. Okay. In other words, words, we are investigating, we are concerned with only with the adiabatic or energy conserving, the adiabatic uh, phase of, of, uh, of the shock wave evolution. This is not always true as the shock wave propagates, it is like a snow plow or uh, you know, so, so it takes uh, snow in front of it or it takes, it is as if you are um, you know, a snow uh, plow or, or, or maybe one of these, one of these mud, uh, 
you know, uh, one of these machines that you see that, that gathers mud and pushes it out. So more and more material, more and more interstellar material is accumulated in front of the shock wave. For a while, the shock wave doesn't care, okay? It just carries on because the amount of interstellar material that's accumulated in front is very, very small. Okay, but beyond a point, the, the amount of material that it accumulates becomes significant, okay, and it slows the shock down, okay. What we are investigating here does not concern that phase. It also, and, and also beyond a, a certain phase of evolution, beyond a certain distance, uh, the energy losses uh, uh, due, to radi uh, due, uh, due to radiation, uh, radiation from the accelerated particles starts to matter. Again, we are investigating the, the, the part of the shock, uh, evolution of the shock wave which does not take either of these effects into con consideration. Uh, which in, in, in other words, uh, we assume that uh, if you inject an amount of energy E into a very small region, that E remains constant, that E is conserved. Okay? It does not decrease with time due to such effects. Okay, so the other important thing is that the ram pressure of the shock front Rho 1 uh, U shock squared, this thing, is much, much larger than the ambient pressure. In other words, you know, here's the shock front. It's got a certain amount of Rho V squared. Rho 1, uh, Rho is just Rho 1 because that's the density of the, of the medium through which the shock, uh, the shock wave is propagating. So the Rho V squared is much, much larger than the pressure outside. It really doesn't care about the pressure outside. It's almost as if there's a vacuum outside uh, on the other side of the shock. Okay, so that's what that's what this means. Okay, you just neglect the the ambient pressure on the other side. Yeah, and um, uh, yeah. So well, it, well, actually, the ambient pressure of the medium through which the shock is propagating. More. So so the the density uh, of the medium is rho one, and the pressure of the medium is P1, but the P1 really doesn't matter at all, okay? It's the kinetic energy of the, of, of the shock front which dominates, right? Okay, therefore, there are only two relevant quantities then, E and P1, uh, E and rho 1. P1 doesn't matter and E does not decrease with time. So that we are left only with two, and this is very, very important, okay? This is one of the main building blocks on which our, uh, the, this, this brilliantly simple theory is constructed. So there are only two relevant quantities, E and rho 1. And now, remember that we, 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 uh, we made use of this word, we mentioned this word, self-similar expansion. In other words, you have a circle at time, say, t equals t1, and at T equals T2, you have the circle expanding like this. It's as if the, the shape remains the same with time. Okay, it's, it's simply as if this fellow has, in, at, at, at a later time, it's simply an enlarged version of what it used to be at, a, at an earlier time. So what you, what, what, so all that matters is really the, the scale of the blast. Okay, some kind, uh, some, some kind of a multiplying factor. Okay, so all you need to know is after time, t uh, I say after, after a certain time has elapsed, say 10 seconds or, or, or 10 years or whatever, I, as long as I know that the expansion, expansion is self-similar, okay, uh, I don't need to worry about the change in the uh, uh, shape of the, of the shock front. I know that the shape of the shock front is the same as what it was at t equals, say, t1. Okay, all I need to know is how much larger is it? In other words, what scale should I multiply it with? Okay, is it 10 times larger? Is it, is it 100 times larger? That's the only thing I need to know. So that, and that's a consequence of, of this assumption. The assumption that the blast wave expands self-similarly. Okay, so therefore, uh, let us now try to Construct a quantity lambda with the dimensions of length, which gives the scale of the blast after time t. Okay, now, now I have only on, so uh, we, we we said that we only have two relevant quantities e and rho one. That's not entirely true. We, uh, true. We also have a time t. So we are left with the task of constructing a quantity 
lambda with dimensions of length from E rho 1 and t. So, what we need to do is we need to play around with this. Or should, should it be e raised to uh, 2 times rho raised to 1 third times t raised to whatever, what combination of these three quantities will give me something with the dimensions of length and turns out that there is only one combination and that is this. This is the only way you can play around as much as you want. This is the only way you can construct uh, you know a quantity with dimensions of length. This has dimensions of length, physical length, uh, centimeter or whatever. Okay. This is the only way you can construct a quantity with dimensions of length from energy, time and density. Okay. So, that is very, very important and, and this is to be kept in mind. Okay. Therefore, now how about a non-dimensionalized distance, right? So, so uh, uh, yeah. So here, consider the dim the the dimensional radius of, of, of the blast wave r at t at time t. Say, you know, this would be so many, um, you know, centimeters or meter or you know astronomical units or whatever. Okay. So this has units of length, so many centimeters or so many meters or so many astronomical units. Okay, at time t. So, so this uh, you know th th this would be a physical you know uh, uh, radius. And now, how about if I I did not want it want to express it in terms of centimeters or whatever? It's a huge number. I would like to express it in units of this lambda, of this lambda. Okay. So I simply write. I I, I construct a new dimensionless variable. This is essentially a. dimensionless length, this psi. Okay, clearly, right? So, r has dimensions of length and lambda by definition has dimensions of length. So, you divide the two and it has no dimensions. Nonetheless, it is telling us something about the scale, right? So, I simply take the definition of lambda that was in the previous slide and I multiply r. So, r over lambda is r times rho 1 over e t squared raised to 1 fifth. Okay. So, this is extremely simple and let us see how far this can take us. Right. So, the dimensionless similarity variable psi, what it does is it labels each radial shell. Okay. So, each shell, each shell, this has a certain label. This is labeled by some, some psi, say psi 1, okay? psi 1. After some time, it is expanded like this and this has another label psi 2. This would be 2 okay? and so on and so forth. So, as long as I know psi 1, I know everything about the shape of the shock at, at, at a certain time uh, and that is it. So, psi essentially it labels each radial shell. It does not change for a giv given shell. All over this shell, I, I, you know, I have the same value of psi 1. Psi changes only when the shell changes. Okay, right. It is a unique combination of R and T as you can see. It is a unique combination of R and T. Psi is uh, directly proportional to R and uh, also Psi is proportional to T raised to minus 2 fifth. Right? That just follows from here. Okay? Can you think of a similar combination of R and T that you have seen earlier? What, how about, how about R minus V T? Okay. 
when you write the wave equation, you know, this, uh, uh, this is also another self similar. Say, you know, you remember, I mean, um, uh, uh, one dimensional, the solution of a one dimensional wave equation is, um, is, is expressed as a function of x minus vt, where v is the uh, speed, speed of the wave. Everything, the entire wave solution is a function of this variable, x minus vt. And so, this is in essentially a similarity variable. So, I just wanted to bring this up because you have actually seen such a thing before. You have actually, this is essentially, this is the equivalent of psi. This is the same thing, this is like psi, this x minus vt. Here in this case, it is not x minus v t, it is it's, it's, uh, this is as good as x, as r, it is not r minus v t, it is r times uh, you know t raised to minus uh, two fifths. That is ok, but still it is in the same spirit. Okay. So, this is a similarity variable and, and it is very similar to this other slightly simpler similarity variable that you have seen before. I just wanted to emphasize this. Okay. Right. So, how does the shock front expand? We use the similarity parameter which contains both r and t and simply using this can we now figure out how the shock front will expand with time, right? So, it is quite simple. Let psi shock, psi underscore shock label the shock front. In other words, yeah, so this simply comes from, so, so um, r shock is psi shock times e t squared over rho 1. This simply comes from, comes from this. This is just a rewrite of this. So, what we do is here, we rewrite this to say uh, r is equal to uh, psi times e t squared over rho 1 raised to 1 fifth and we just put a, put a, a, a shock a subscript on, on both of them and that is all this is. Yeah. So, Right. Okay. What this is saying is that the radius, the physical location of the shock, uh, what this is saying is that R shock is proportional to T raised to 2 fifth. That is a prediction. Okay, so so just just look at the beauty of this. Simply from dimension analysis, simply from the fact that you have that that well, essentially simply from the fact that we uh, the, uh, that that the energy is constant. Okay, it does not change with time, and uh, the only relevant variables now are the energy, the density, and of course the time. Yeah. And the fact and, and the assumption that the shock front spreads out self similarly, just with these three assumptions, okay, we are able to, to say something quite profound about the manner in which this shock front spreads out with time. This is the uh, you know um, this is the prediction. Okay. We really did not have to resort to too much shock physics or anything. Okay. However, we did make use of some very important physical uh, you know assumptions and and we've detailed them earlier and what it also means is that if any one of these assumptions are violated then you know uh, this this nice this nice result uh, cannot be obtained it also means that right okay so um, right is it borne out by observations if it's not it's no good you can make all kinds of fancy predictions but it has to be borne out by observations obviously right we will uh, you know examine this as you can as you can sort of anticipate yes there are uh, regimes where observations uh, you know support this very well and I, i'll show you one such observation and also the velocity of shock expansion you just differentiate uh, r with respect to t and so the v shock which is dr shock dt goes as t raised to minus three fifths proportional to t raised to minus Three fifths. What is this saying? 
as time progresses, the velocity decreases in this manner. Right? Okay. Now let us let us so 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 this is an answer to this. This this is an answer to this question, and uh, this is data, for, uh, very declassified data from a nuclear explosion in New Mexico in 1945. Uh, mark the date. This is around the time that uh, the First World War ended. So um, so these crosses these crosses crosses here, okay, uh, here, here. These are all crosses, okay, so on and so forth. There are many crosses here, okay. What this is, you cannot read it very well, but what this is is log base of 10 time. And what this is, is log base of 10 r uh, and it's 5 halves. That is on this axis and this is, this is plotted on this axis. Now, why are we doing this? Remember that the, the prediction was that our shock would go as t raised to two fifths, right? So you take the you take the log on both sides. So log R shock equals two fifths log T. You agree? And you 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 multiply five halves on both sides. So five halves log R shock would be would, would be one times log T. Right? So you're plotting log T here and five halves log R shock here, R shock or R for that matter. And it should be a straight line with slope 1. And these crosses that you see, the cross here, cross here, all these crosses lie amazingly well. This is a fitted line. This straight line is a fitted line. And the data agrees amazingly well with this prediction. It's almost scary how well the data agrees. Okay, so this is an amazing vindication of 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 our simple uh, prediction uh, of the prediction that that uh, that involved only these simple assumptions: the fact that the energy remains unchanged, the ram pressure of the shock front is much much larger than the ambient pressure, and 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 therefore there are two um, you know uh, there are only two relevant quantities, and of course the other thing is that the shock front evolves self similarly. So this, I mean, so at least by way of terrestrial shocks, uh, terrestrial, um, you know, uh, shocks produced by a bomb blast, the data uh, agrees amazingly well uh, with the predictions. So this gives us some confidence that uh, the way we are proceeding is indeed correct. So we'll f stop for the time being and thank you.